In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the preceding weeks, on the segment entitled Learning to Live in God's Divine Will, there was addressed the distinction between the full, perfect, and complete life of God in the soul. And these adjectives are found in Louise's writings from various extrapolated passages, including her volumes, the Blessed Virgin Mary in the Kingdom of the Divine Will book, the Hours of the Passion book, the Pious Pilgrimage of the Soul in the Divine Will book, also known as the Rounds in Creation, Louisa's letters, her childhood memoirs, and so forth. Now, to recap very briefly, the fullness of the life of God as distinct from the perfect life and the complete life is not to be understood as three separate lives. They're not separable. They're distinct. Just like the two, three persons of the Trinity or the two natures of Christ, once incarnate in human nature, are distinct but inseparable for all eternity. Similarly, the adjective's full, perfect, and complete life in the divine will is really one life. But these adjectives represent different stages in attaining the absolute union with God's will. And as articulated a few weeks ago, full, the adjective full, in relation to full life or full union with God's will, refers to grace. If you recall the angel Gabriel, when he appeared to Mary, hailed her as not only the most highly favored daughter, but as one who is full of grace. So this fullness is connected to the grace of God being outpoured upon the soul that disposes it to accede to the greater gifts. As St. Paul puts it in his 13th chapter to the Corinthians, aspire to the greatest gifts, and once we accede to these gifts, God then embellishes us with them. The key word here is gift. They're not obtained, they're freely given. But we must dispose ourselves for that freely bestowed gift, much like a child receives on Christmas Eve a gift from Santa Claus or his parent, but if he's has misbehaved throughout the year, no gift will come. So we must dispose ourselves for God's greatest gifts. Perfect in relation to the life or union with God's will is an adjective that is always connected with the quality of one's manner of acting. If fullness is related to grace, perfection is to quality. So the soul's union with God that seeks to attain perfection through its intellect, memory, and will, seeking to be united with the source of their motion, of their rationality, of their volition, of their recollection, um, improves its attentiveness, its fidelity in its manner of behaving. And these actions on the part of the soul have to do with perfecting. So perfection is related to the quality of one's actions. By the way, this manner of acting never ends in this life. We are always to perfect in ever-increasing degrees the way in which we serve God. And this is only possible by the grace of God. So God wants to lead us to the fullness of grace in order to continuously perfect our mode of acting. And even if a person has, let's say, an old age dementia or Alzheimer's or Parkinson's and the brain, not the intellect, the brain is impaired to some extent, that does not slow down the propensity of the soul's flight to heaven or uh, slow down its acceleration in its attainment of the heavenly homeland. God's grace can be at work even in someone as incapacitated as a woman confined to bed who is irresponsive to the doctors or the nurses, but yet is completely aware of their surroundings and what's going on. There was a case, in fact, of a doctor who was suffering from meningitis, and he was brain dead, clinically brain dead, for several hours. And when he came back, by a miracle, he described everything that they were doing in the hospital bed above his body. He could see it. He could witness it, even though his brain was not producing any activity. Because his intellect 
was the recipient of the grace of God, not the brain. And then there's the fullness and the perfection and then the completion of the life or the union with the will of God. I spoke of fullness in relation to grace, perfection in relation to the most quality of acting and now completion in relation to the quantity of acts the creature is obliged by God to perform in this life that subsequently establishes within its will a kingdom. All of the soul's acts are accomplished and completed in this life or are supposed to be so in order to avoid having any empty voids within it that merit purgatory. So when we're reading the writings of Louisa and we speak of a soul not going to purgatory because it lives in God's divine will, we must revisit this more carefully in light of these three adjectives of fullness, perfection, and completion. Because... In the past, people have said, and this is an incomplete statement, partially true, partially blank, anyone who lives in the divine will will not go to purgatory because that's what Jesus tells Louisa. Well, is that exactly what he tells her? Let us review Jesus' words, and then I will focus the rest of today's reflection upon the third stage of this union and life with and in God's will, namely completion. In the previous segments, I have addressed fullness of grace, perfection of quality of acting, and today we'll focus more on the completion, which is the final stage that Louisa attained in living in God's divine will on November 16, 1900, when she was 35 years old. But before we do that, let's address the matter of purgatory. I will try to pull it up here, and I think it comes from a volume nine, volume 14, April 29th, 1928. Jesus tells Louisa, If the soul who lives in the divine will should go to purgatory, the angels and blessed in heaven would all feel offended. The entire universe would rebel. And they would not let it go to purgatory alone. The heavens, the sun, the wind, the sea would all follow this soul, follow it, moving from their places and offended, say to the Creator, this soul of yours and ours, the life that animates all of us, animates the soul. How is this soul in purgatory? The heavens would claim the soul with their love. The sun would speak up with its light. The wind with its lamenting voice, the sea with its tumultuous waves, all would have a word to say to defend this soul who lived its life in common with them. But since one who lives in my will absolutely cannot go to purgatory, the universe will remain in its place, and my will shall have the triumph of bringing to heaven the soul who has lived in it on this exilic earth. All right, so here Jesus says, one who lives in my will absolutely cannot go to purgatory. Now, does this mean that a soul who lives in the divine will in an imperfect manner will avoid purgatory? as does a soul who lives in it in a complete manner and a perfect manner. Well, first, let me, before answering that question, share with you the different ways in which a soul lives in God's divine will. In volume 11, Jesus tells Louisa, some souls live in my will in an imperfect way, others in a more perfect way, and yet others reach the point of completely losing themselves in my will. So here Jesus makes it clear that not all souls live in the divine will with the same intensity, vehemency, detachment, love, perfection. They don't. And that's beautiful because it shows that it's not impossible to attain. So if a soul on earth is not as attentive as Louisa, is not as detached as Louisa, is not 
as self-mortifying and sacrificial and selfless as Louisa, they can still receive this gift, even in an imperfect way. However, when God is referring to the souls that bypass purgatory, and I will show you why I will say what I'm about to say, he's referring to souls who have completed filling up all the voids in their soul, namely, establishing a divine kingdom in their soul. Now, a soul that's living in an imperfect way has not done that. It has left a few voids in its soul, which have to be filled in purgatory. Now, Jesus touches upon this in Louisa's writings when he speaks of the complete act of the soul performed in the divine will. To get to the full flavor of this, let me pull up this passage. I believe it's from um, volume There's quite a few volumes here, actually. He speaks of a complete act of the soul in volume 11, October 29th, 1914. And he speaks of this also in volume 25 on December 21st, 1928. But let us get to the kernel of the matter. Jesus tells Louisa that living in the divine will confers upon the soul the complete act, which imparts the fullness of the life of its creator and the possession of God himself. This complete act is a pure gift of God from the good of all crea- for the good of all creation that is maintained by the soul's stability and virtue, which empowers it to seal within itself the fullness and totality of the Supreme Being. Let me pause for a moment. Just I want to roll up these blinds that are making some noise. The wind is speaking to me through the blinds, and the blinds are rattling, so let me just grow them up a second. All right. The wind is crying out for everyone to live in the divine will. That's what it's doing right now. Jesus tells us that in the Louis' volumes. So, this complete act seals within itself the fullness and totality of the Supreme Being. Now, if you recall, in the fear of creation, Adam possessed the gift of living in the divine will, in its totality, but he never succeeded in possessing it in its completion. And therefore, even though the total life of the divine will was in his soul, as well as the power to bilocate his soul in all created things, since he failed to complete filling all the voids in his soul and therefore establishing a kingdom, he, his mission of depositing within himself the acts of all creatures remained incomplete, and his incompleted acts remained suspended. Jesus tells this often to Louisa throughout volumes um, 12 through 24. But by virtue of, of course, Jesus and Mary and Louisa's having done what Adam failed to do. She succeeded and they completed, Jesus and Mary, in completing all the acts God had established for them in creation for the formation of a divine kingdom within their soul. When you do that, you bypass purgatory because you have filled all the voids in your soul that purgatory would otherwise fill had you not filled them yourself on earth. I'm going to try to find this passage too where Jesus alludes to this teaching. Where the soul has to go to purgatory to basically fill up these voids in its soul. And while I'm looking for this passage, 
we must remember that the filling up of these acts of all creation in the soul, I touched upon it briefly in that quotation I just cited, is done by God in the soul. It's a gift. The complete act is a gift from God in the soul, given to the soul who is desirous to receive this complete act, namely, by living in the state of grace, exercising the virtues, doing good deeds, and with an upright intention and firm desire, seek this gift. Now, getting back to the voids, the soul that has to f go to purgatory in order to fill these voids. I found it here. Just took a little searching. And I'm going to refer, relate to you where you may find this as well, both in Louisa's volumes as well as in the dissertation. In the doctoral dissertation, it's approved by the University in Rome, the Vatican University. It's found on page 113, pages 113 and 487. And if we go to page 113, we will find that Jesus tells Louisa this truth in... Several passages on volume 4, September 4th, 1901, and especially in volume 4, July 16th, 1901. He tells her, know that each soul throughout the entire course of its life is obliged to love me constantly, without intervals. If the soul does not love me incessantly, it leaves as many voids within it or as many minutes, hours, or days in which it has neglected to love me. No soul will be able to enter heaven if it has not filled these voids. One is able to fill them only by redoubling its love for me for the rest of its life. If it does not reach the point of filling these voids on earth, it will be compelled to do so in the fires of purgatory. Now, there's the answer of why a soul living in an imperfect way in the divine will cannot bypass purgatory. Because imperfection means it has not perfected the art of filling all the voids in its soul. Some are left vacant, even if it's so much as one void. Now, purgatory is not all one general state that all experience equally. No, it's not. The saints teach us this. Several saints, Gertrude, um, Alphonse de Luquari, Catherine of Genova, and so forth, they talk of three different levels in purgatory. The closest to heaven, the soul experiences in purgatory only the absence of God, no pain, no physical pain. Some may say, well, how can it experience physical pain if the body is in the earth and the soul is in heaven? There should be no physical pain. Well, God, through its special dispensation, allows the souls in hell and in purgatory to experience sensible pain. Not physical, sensible. As if it had a body. And as Faustina relates in her description on hell, the seven sufferings of hell in her diary of, of the soul, states that in hell, where she was taken, not only do souls suffer the perpetual remorse of conscience and eternal darkness and the terrible stench and the presence of Satan and the loss of God and the knowledge of all the sins everyone else there committed, that they all see in each other, and perpetual despair, and the list goes on. But she also says that the some souls in hell are tortured in niches and they are they are tortured according to the senses and faculties with which they sinned in the body on earth, even though the body is not in hell with the soul. It remains in the earth until the final judgment. So even in this interim period, from the particular judgment to the general judgment, the souls in purgatory do experience sensible, intense, and eternal suffering. 
and some according to the faculties with which they sinned. Well, in purgatory, the same dynamism applies, with the difference that in heaven, in purgatory, you're saved for eternity. But the souls in the lower two stages, according to the saints I mentioned and others, experience also sensible suffering corresponding to the senses that, in, that they engaged in in sinning. So there's a, the lowest stage is close to hell, and there's the middle stage where the suffering is sensitive, sensible suffering is alleviated somewhat, and then there's the third stage, which is right next to heaven, where there's no sensible suffering, just the absence of God, which is a suffering in itself, but it's not sensible, meaning it doesn't engage the faculties of the senses. So, a soul that has not succeeded in filling all the voids on earth will have to go to purgatory, one of these three stages. So when people say, a soul who lives in the divine world will not go to purgatory, we must revisit that and qualify it now. By distinguishing the stages of full, perfect, and complete. These three adjectives come from the Blessed Virgin Mary book and the Kingdom of the Divine Will that I quoted in a previous segment. It comes also from Jesus' own volumes and Louise's own words. She, certainly, Jesus uses different adjectives or different ways of living, like imperfect, perfect, and complete. But it's he also uses full, total, integral, absolute, perfect, complete. And as I mentioned earlier, many of these adjectives are synonymous to complete, like integral. But getting back to the... Um, theme at hand. I'm just closing out this volume to pull up this quote I wanted to share with you. The grace of the complete act imparts to the soul the fullness of the life of its creator. Now, to better understand how we dispose ourselves to receive this pure gift from God, namely the complete act, let us go back a bit and understand what the adjective completion means in Louise's writings. Adam was given the total life of the divine will in Eden before he sinned. Now, total as distinguished from complete, sometimes they are used synonymously, but when it comes to union, they are not synonymous. They are synonymous when it comes to God's outpouring of his gift that establishes a perfect union of his will with ours. But just because God gives you perfect union with his will, like he did to Adam and Eve before original sin, does not mean that their fate is sealed. It does not mean that they succeeded in accomplishing, fulfilling the task at hand in Eden. They didn't. So God gave Adam and Eve the total life of his will in Eden. But what does that mean? It means he had a mission to accomplish with that total union. And if he failed in that mission, he would not only lose the total union, but the completion of all the acts he was to perform in Eden and establishing the kingdom and obtaining the complete act in his will. So let's go to original sin. Well, to give you an analogy of the difference, distinction between total and complete, consider yourself as Adam or Eve, if you're a man or a woman listening. God has just given you the whole cosmos at your fingertips that expand far beyond Eden. And God has infused within you the knowledge of your dominion as queen and king over this entire ever-expanding cosmos, which... It's probable, has no end. We don't know if the physical material order of the universe has no end. We don't know. The scientists don't even know this. It is possible that God has had created at one point in time. We don't know the exact date. All we know is that Adam was created 6,000 years ago in 4,000 BC. This is based on biblical genealogies, and it's also found in Louisa's writings. But the earth preceded Adam. We know that as a biblical fact. 
so did the universe. Because Adam was created on the sixth day and everything was created before him, right? Including the angels. But when it was created, we don't know. It could have been millions of years. We don't know. Billions, who knows? All speculation. But what we do know is that God created the universe at some point in outside of time, but in the material order. Time did not exist until original sin. There were no days and nights. There was no changing of seasons until original sin. Time began with original sin. Before that, there was no time. So God created the universe outside of time in the material order. He brought the material order into existence, which before then did not exist. Everything was immaterial. So God has infused within you, kings and queens, the entire universe, and given you this infused knowledge that you are to now, having been given the totality of the union with God's will, as the angels enjoy, a mission. You are to take that total union that you enjoy now and fill up creation with redoubled love through your acts of love in all creation. So you are to become the voice of the sun to glorify and praise God on behalf of the sun and on behalf of the moon and the stars and the grass and the waters and the animals therein, etc. And not only that, but you are to also glorify and thank and praise and intercede on behalf of your offspring, that has yet to come to light. And if you should fail in that endeavor, and if you should fail gravely, like Adam and Eve, not only will you lose the totality of the union that God gave you, but you will never obtain the complete act, which is filling up all the voids in your soul, whereby you go straight to heaven when you die. Now, if you were in Eden, you don't die. You remain there for all eternity. But you will be given a crown of kingship, which Adam and Eve never obtained because they failed to complete their mission. So totality doesn't mean you've done it all. It means you've received it all, but now you have to give back to God for all that which you received by engaging God's own activity in the creation he has given to you as a gift. That, once you've done that, that, then you've attained completion. See the distinction between total union and complete union, or total union and completion of all your acts in the divine will? Well, now you can imagine how grave original sin was, because when God made Adam and Eve, he placed within them three sons, three infusions of the power of God, the power of the Father, the wisdom of the Son, the clemency of the Holy Spirit, faith, hope, and love in their perfected forms. In volume 424, on June 7th, 1928, Jesus tells Louisa, My daughter, these three sons exist in man, but they find themselves in the same condition as the sun that shines in the sky while surrounded by thick clouds that prevent the brightness of its light from illuminating the earth. And although the sun's communications are neither interrupted nor broken by these clouds, their effects upon the earth remained encumbered, and the earth fails to benefit from all the good the sun is capable of offering. Such is the condition of man today. All things are properly disposed, and between us, the Trinity, and man, nothing is interrupted or broken, but the human will is, has formed thick clouds that render man bereft of the glory, order, and harmony that he enjoyed at the time of creation. Okay, so these three sons that God had placed in Adam and Eve's souls, in their intellect, memory, and will, were really emanations of God's one eternal operation that not only illuminated their bodies, but enabled their thoughts, words, and actions to become timeless, impacting all things of all time. Because, and as much as God is eternal and embraces and transcends all time, so the soul in whom is operation extends its work through the thoughts, words, and actions of man. Jesus tells Louisa in volume 
16 February 20th, 1924. As man withdrew from the supreme will, he rejected all these gifts. But the divinity did not reabsorb them within itself. Rather, the divinity left them suspended in its will, waiting for the human will to bind itself to the divine will and re-enter the original order that God had established. Therefore, all the artistry of love that I was to enjoy with Adam in his state of sinlessness is suspended in my will. My will wants to unleash the abundance of blessings it had established for all creatures, and this is why I want to establish the law of living in my will to actualize all these suspended blessings between the Creator and the human creature. And this is why I am working in you, Louisa, to reorder your will within the divine will, for by this means I will actualize and reawaken the many blessings that until now have been suspended between the Creator and the human creature. I am so elated by this reordering of the human will within the divine will to enable it to completely live in my will. See the word completely. That until I obtain this objective, creation will not fulfill the primary purpose that we, the Trinity, intended. So Adam emerges in Louisa's writings as well as Eve. Let's not remember that Eve and Adam were co-conspirators in the act of original sin, they emerge as the paradigm of total union, perfect cooperation with the divine will because they had the fullness of grace like Mary. Their acts were perfect until original sin. So they had totality, they had perfection, they had fullness, and yet they interrupted the mission they were to accomplish in Eden which was to deposit within their souls, filling in all the voids God had put there, acts of love, praise, thanksgiving, blessing, intercessory prayer. And despite their failure to maintain the state of perfection, God still held out for them salvation through a prophesied Redeemer. Adam and Eve, Though perfect and total in Eden, their union with God remained incomplete on account of original sin. And their progeny were born incomplete, without the totality, without the perfection, without the fullness with which they were created, because of the transmission of the effects of original sin. So Jesus reveals to Louisa in volume 18, February 11th, 1926, by withdrawing from the divine will, Adam placed himself at a distance from his creator. This distance debilitated him, impoverished him, disorientated him completely, and caused disorientation in all generations. Because when evil is in the root, the entire tree is forced to feel its malignant effect, the bad humors that are in the root. So on account of original sin, human nature became darkened, blinded to the eternal light it once possessed. These three sons that were freely operating in Adam and Eve and producing a charitable commerce between him and all creation, establishing harmony, unity, redoubling the love, glory, and praise of God in and through creation, was suspended. These three sons were suspended. But in his humanity, Jesus accomplished what Adam failed to accomplish, by filling in his human will, filling up in his human will, all the acts, divine acts, that generated spiritual light and restored to human nature the kingdom of the divine will. This is evident in Louisa's volume 13, chapter uh, September 28, 1921, when he reveals, I am eternal light, and everything that comes from me is light. That is why it is not only my heartbeat that brings forth light, but each one of my thoughts, breaths, words, steps, and each drop of my blood is light that I bring forth and which diffuses amidst all souls, becoming the life of each one of them that seeks the requital of their little lights. And inasmuch as these little lights were brought forth from within my own light, 
they too may be said to be the refulgence of my light. But since but sin changes the soul's works into darkness. So Jesus vested the human being with his own light of grace, so that it may in turn form sons, making reparation to him, generating spiritual light more refulgent than the earth's suns, and diffuse this light throughout creation for the good of souls. This concept of the human being forming sons in the divine will for the establishment of God's kingdom, we must remember is a mystical phenomenon that the senses cannot completely apprehend. This is also found in volume 13, January 14th, 1922. Where Louisa relates, I found myself outside of my body and I saw the heavens opened and the light issue forth that is inaccessible to any creature. Let me repeat that. I found myself outside of my body and I saw the heavens open and a light issue forth that is inaccessible to any creature. So this means that your acts while generating light, light here and now on earth, you cannot see. This is kept from you deliberately by God so that you can exercise your faith. If you were to see this life, there would be no need for faith. Faith is believing in things you do not see. And she adds in this passage of January 14th, 1922, these rays that I saw outside of my body come from the heavens, descended from within this light that invested all creatures in heaven, in purgatory, and on earth. Some rays were so dazzling that while being invested, enraptured, and delighted by them, such creatures could not at all describe what they contained. Now, the expression here Louisa uses, that she found herself outside of her body, throughout her volume she uses this, and even when speaking of her conf to her confessors and of her confessors, when describing her condition, attests to her having experienced on numerous occasions the mystical phenomenon that of her soul bilocated and transported outside of her body throughout creation. It's a mystical transport. To her, it was an extraordinary gift. We have, most of us, have ordinary gifts. So we can bilocate our souls just like she did. But we may not experience everything she did because she was given this extraordinary mystical gift of transport, mystical transport, where literally her body became like lead, heavy as a as a ton of bricks, so to speak. Nobody could move her. And her, her senses, her, her faculties, her bodily senses were suspended during this time. So you could poke her with a pin, she wouldn't feel it. Similar to the phenomenon of the children in Medjugorje when they're in ecstasy or in vision. You can distract them, poke them, and they don't have any external response to these external stimuli. We don't always have these gifts, okay? And we don't have to have them to experience this gift that she experienced. Now, Jesus and Mary rendered complete the union and the mission that Adam and Eve interrupted, namely of enclosing the divine lives and acts of all souls within their respective humanities and establish within themselves the divine kingdom that Adam and Eve failed to accomplish in their soul. I don't know if you recall, but Adam appeared to Louisa to thank her for having fulfilled the role he forfeited. And I don't know if I can pull that up on the spur. I think it's from 1926, October 26, volume 20. I think that's where it's from. Where Adam appears to Louisa and acknowledges that he never fulfilled the mission he was given in Eden of filling up all the voids in his soul with acts of love, acts of all creatures, and subsequently impacting all creatures and giving them the grace to live in the divine will. So he appears to her to thank her for having fulfilled the role he forfeited with sin. He never finished establishing the kingdom of acts in his soul. And that is why. He was expelled from Eden, 
because he allowed imp- not only imperfection, but sin to enter therein, along with Eve. They both committed a grave sin. First Eve, then Adam. But you know, here's the here's a mystery that Jesus tells Louisa. He tells Louisa that in all heaven, all of heaven, this is why Louisa was on earth, there is no saint that can compare with Adam in holiness. Even though you had people like John the Baptist, who never committed one sin in their life, or like St. Joseph, who never committed one venial sin, Adam is greater than them in heaven in holiness. How is this possible? Jesus tells this to Louisa. Because of the gift that he had given him in the, freely in the Garden of Eden, God had predestined, chosen Adam, apart from all of the creatures in the universe, despite all their sacrifices and efforts and loyalty and, and submissiveness to his will. God predestined Adam for the greatest holiness through the gift of living in the divine will. And even though Adam committed the grave sin of original sin that infected the whole human race, along with Eve, even though Adam lost the total union with the will of God in Eden on account of original sin and was reduced to a poor state of exile, having to earn his keep by the sweat of his brow, and Eve suffering childbearing pains and enduring aging and suffering and death, on account of their sin, even though Adam failed to fulfill the mission that Louisa fulfilled and went to limbo, awaiting for the gates of heaven to be opened, along with all the patriarchs and prophets and the just of the past, when he made it to heaven, he was given the highest place in all of heaven after Mary. But Jesus tells Louisa that only two people on earth have completed on earth the filling up of all the voids of their souls by bilocating their wills throughout creation and thanking and blessing and praising and interceding on their behalf for God's glory. Only two souls on earth have done this, and therefore these two souls will occupy the highest two places in heaven. Now, I'm paraphrasing, but Jesus did give Louisa her vision while she was on earth of two souls at the helm of all human generations. And one soul was the Blessed Mother and the other was Louisa, which implies, suggests, that they are the two at the top in heaven, so to speak. These places were initially meant for Adam and Eve. But now that Adam and Eve had failed their test, God has taken away the talent and given it to the new Eve, which is Mary. We know in St. Paul's letter that the new Eve is, the new Adam is Jesus, but Jesus is God. And God had called from all eternity two virgins to the salvation of the human race. And it could very well be that these two people that will be at the top and among all the orders of saints in heaven are Mary and Louisa. There's ample evidence in Louisa's writings to sustain this thesis, to make this argument. But... The complete act was lost by, I shouldn't say lost, was never attained by Adam because he never fulfilled the work of completing all, or fulfilling all the empty voids of his soul and completing his mission on earth and therefore establishing a kingdom within his soul. He failed in that. But Jesus said Mary did the task, the new Adam, the new Eve. And then Jesus said he had to call another woman a virgin to the salvation of the human race because the work of redemption did not complete sanctification. It began the work of completion. Yes, Jesus completed everything in his own humanity, 
but the work of bringing the kingdom of the divine will on earth, which is sanctification, bringing the divine will on earth as in heaven has not yet been completed. Just look around you today. It's obvious that the divine will is not reigning on earth as it is among the blessed and angels in heaven. So what will complete this work of bringing to earth the divine will as it is lived in heaven? In addition to the work of redemption, there must be the work of sanctification, with the agent of whom is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit calls to his aid a virgin. Just like Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, called to his aid a virgin to come to the world. So the Holy Spirit has to call to the aid a virgin to come to the world. And the Holy Spirit will come to this world. That's why we call it a new Pentecost. He will come again. Greater than he came upon the apostles. Thousand times greater than he came upon the apostles. He will come upon all creation, not just human beings. And when he descends in this new Pentecost, which is an expression used by two saints, namely John the 23rd and Pope John Paul II, two popes, he will do it because an, a second virgin, namely Luisa Picaretta, gave her fiat to God, like Mary gave it to the angel Gabriel. Or like Mary gave it to God through the angel Gabriel. And he will literally enliven this planet whereby Satan will have no hold on us. Satan will be enchained for 1,000 years, symbolic expression, meaning a long period of time, found in the book of Revelation, chapter 20. And during this enslavement of chains of Satan for 1,000 years, there will be peace throughout all the earth. There will be no atheists, there will be no non-Christian believers, or I should say, no vincibly um, atheists, vincible atheists on earth. None that vincibly deny Jesus is the Messiah. Everyone will believe and accept that Jesus is the only Messiah. This is also reported in the Bible, where every knee will bend and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, or in Matthew's Gospel, where Jesus says that the meek will inherit the earth. These times are coming. They're upon us. They're in our lifetime. Already, there's a, the birth pangs have already begun. This is why you see all the general confusion in the world, in the state, the church in the world today. These are all the preceding birth pangs of the new birth of the new Pentecost. So don't be fluttered and hopeless and despairing and worried when you see things going awry in and outside of the church today. This is all the beginnings of the great birth that's about to take place. This is why we know we're living in the eye of the hurricane right now. It will get worse before it gets better, but the, the worst part will be very brief. And then when the resurrection occurs, or the new Pentecost occurs, call it what you may, the resurrection of souls to the divine will, then those that will remain after this fiery chastisement that Peter speaks about in his second letter, a third of humanity, as testified by Zechariah in the Old Testament, then that one-third, as in the days of Noah, will be meek, and they will inherit the earth, and they will return to an agrarian society, as in the days of Adam and Eve, where big tech will be gone, thanks be to God. And the monopolization they exercise today over freedom, our rights and liberties, Nothing wrong with big tech, as long as they serve God, but the problem is they don't. They serve the almighty dollar, and we all know that. But thanks be to God that, at least in part, it's being used for the glory of God. And it's doing a great good, even though it's being used for a lot of evil. So Jesus and Mary, the new Adam, the new Eve, and Louisa, the second virgin call from eternity to help bring about the kingdom of God on earth. Not the kingdom, sorry, the divine will on earth kingdom of God is already here, um, have fulfilled, completed what Adam and Eve failed to fulfill and complete. Now, this isn't just for Louisa, this gift of completing all the acts of God's operation in all creation throughout the cosmos by bilocating our souls therein, but it's meant for all of us as well. 
Jesus tells Louise that in the measure the soul who lives in the divine will corresponds to his grace and mediates to the human race, this grace, by bilocating its soul through its rounds in creation, it offers God's greater glory. By rendering him glory for ten, for a hundred, for a thousand, and for the whole work of creation, the soul renders creation's glory complete. And this complete glory consists in the soul's offering its acts to God for his greatest glory on behalf of all creatures. It's offering new creation, God, no, no, creation new glory. It's surrounding Jesus in the Eucharist with greater glory, embodying the Our Father prayer and hastening its fulfillment on earth. Take, for example, just one passage of Louisa, volume 12, May 22, 1999. He tells her, Louisa, what some souls do not offer me, I take from other souls, in whom I redouble the graces that others reject from me. And from these I receive double love and glory. To others, according to their dispositions, I reach the point of giving the graces I would otherwise give to ten. To others, those I would give to a hundred. Yet to others, those I would give to a thousand. Sometimes I give to some the graces that I would give to entire cities, states, and even entire countries. Imagine that. There are few souls today that are serious and willing to give up everything to live in God's divine will. Very few souls. Whether it's through due to concern of losing what they have or being persecuted. And, by the way, fear of human respect is an obstacle to living in the divine will. If you feel being persecuted by your uh, your people, your friends, your family, because you're promoting Louisa, then you're not a candidate for living in the divine will. There should be no fear. God is looking for warrior souls that believe in this gift, not only because it's approved by the Church with the seals of the Imprimatur and Nihil Upstart, which says enough and, uh, and wides on its own merit, the Hours of the Passion, the Blessed Virgin Mary book have these seals, Apart from the fact that St. Hannibal de Francia gave the first, and Bishop Joseph Leo gave the imprimatur in the of to the first 19 volumes, but to the fact that these soul, these words are written by a soul who had zero education virtually. It could not come from her. And they lead souls to God in the sacraments, so they could not come from the devil. So that leaves you only one option. They must come from God. Well, Jesus tells Louisa that to those few souls who are willing to lay down their lives for this gift. I won't just give them double the graces that another soul refuse me, refuses me. I will give them the graces of an entire country. We're talking about hundreds of millions of souls. The graces that hundreds of millions of souls reject, one person gets. And he adds, in this passage of March 23rd, 1931, is that the right? No, it's a different passage. Uh, this passage of um, May 22nd, 1919. In this way, my glory on the part of creation is completed. Because God gives to one soul all the graces millions, hundreds of millions refuse. And in this sense, God's glory is completed in that soul on behalf of others. And when I see that the soul cannot proceed in spite of its goodwill, I draw it into my will, where it finds the virtue of multiplying one single act for as many times as it wants, giving me the glory, the honor, and the love that others do not give me. So you see, this complete glory consists of the soul's offering its divine acts to God for his greatest glory on behalf of creatures, and so forth. Well, I'll have to stop here. I'm out of time. Thank you for your patience. May God bless you, and may you do all your acts in God's most holy will one day at a time beginning with your prevenient act. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.